أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين سبقت لهم من الحسن أولئك عنها مبعدون لا يسمعون حسيسها وهم في مشتهد أنفسهم خالدون لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر وتتلقى ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن الأرض يرثها ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن أن الأرض يرثها عبادي الصالحون إن في هذا لبلاغ لقوم ما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين 
صدق الله العظيم Sayın Genel Sekreterim, değerli büyüklerim ve uzak yakın demeden buraya gelen kıymetli kardeşlerim, sizleri saygı, hürmet ve Allah'ın selamı ile selamlıyorum. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. Selamet Tatang. Bizleri yoktan var eden, varlığından haberdar eden Allah'a hamd, alemlere rahmet, müminlere önder olan peygambere salat ve selam olsun. Böylesine nezih ve İslam'ın dertleriyle dertlenen mümtaz bir topluluğa hitap ettiğim için onur duyuyorum. Şiddetin, savaşın ve yıkımın hiç olmadığı kadar arttığı, insanların din, dil, ırk ayrımına maruz bırakıldığı bir dünyada yaşıyor, yaşıyoruz. Böylesine acımasızlaşmış ve vicdanı körelmiş bir dünyada maalesef haktan ve adaletten bahis bile edilemeyecek bir duruma geldik. Fakat bundan daha kötüsü barışı ve kardeşliği önceleyen ve bu merhametsizlik girdabında sürüklenen insanlığın yegane çaresi olan İslam'ın savaş ve terör ile özdeşleştirilmesi bununla beraber inanan insanların kendi ülkesinde dahi rahat bırakılmadığı ve birçok sıkıntılara katlandıklarını görüyoruz. Hemen yanı başımızdaki Burma'da yaşanan insanlık trajedisi ve Müslümanların sadece inançlarından dolayı kadın, çocuk veya yaşlı denilmeden acımasızca katledildiklerini gördük. Komünist rejim altındaki Müslüman Uygur Türklerinin hala devam eden katliamlar, ve baskılar altında ne kadar sıkıntılar çektiklerini görüyoruz. Suriye'de, Mısır'da, Arakan'da ve dünyanın birçok yerindeki Müslüman kardeşlerimizin çektikleri acıları gördük ve maalesef görmeye devam ediyoruz. İslam milletlerinin bu zor durumunda dahi yine İslam'a hizmet ettiklerini sanan ve maalesef İslam toplumlarını iyice zor duruma sokan birçok hareketle karşı karşıya kalmış bulunmaktayız. İttihadın İttifakın ve uhuvetin İslam dünyasında böylesine lazım olduğu bir zamanda ayrı durmayı, ters düşmeyi, kavga ve çatışma ortamını tetikleyen masum insanların canına kast eden cinayet şebekeleri yüzünden İslam terörizm adı altında onarılması güç yaralar almaktadır. İslam'ın insanlığın verdiği umut ve irfan tohumlarının önüne set çeken ve Hazreti Muhammed sallallahu aleyhi ve sellemin yolunu ve rehberliğini reddedip kendilerine bambaşka bir yol çizen kimi gruplar yüzünden İslam coğrafyası çözülmeyi bekle bekleyen sayısız sorunlar içerisinde boğulmaktadır. Bizler genç İDSB olarak İslam dünyasının içine düşür düşürüldüğü bu vahim tablodan kurtulmanın yegane çözümü olarak gençleri görmekteyiz. Allah'ın ipine sımsıkı sarılın, 
asla ayrılmayın emrine itaat edecek olan bu taze kanlar ile Müslüman milletler içinden çıkamadıkları problemlerinden İslam, ümmet ve ittihat şuuruyla kuşanmış bir gençlik ile Allah'ın izniyle kurtulacaktır. Şimdiki ve gelecek nesillerin genç insanları sayesinde İslam içinde bulunduğu cehalet, zaruret ve sefalet duvarlarını yıkacak ve dünyaya İslam'ın nurlu hakikatlerini haykıracaktır. Fakat bu minvalde gençliğin alacağı birçok inisiyatifler de bulunmaktadır. Ashab-ı kiramın nadide varisleri olan bu Müslüman gençliğin öncelikle İslam'ı ve peygamberini iyi tanıması gerekmektedir. Nitekim şimdiki ahvalden kurtuluş reçetesi de İslam'ı ve peygamberi iyi tanımaktan geçmektedir. Özellikle Malezya ve Türkiye'de İslami gençlik hareketlerinin hız kazanması ve özgüveni tam bir şekilde dava şuuruna sahip bireylerin varlığı diğer İslam milletlerine cesaret vermektedir. Bu tür bir nimete sahip olduğumuz için Allah'a ne kadar şükretsek azdır. Fakat Türkiye'de ve Malezya gibi imkanların fazlaca olduğu yerlerde bizlerin üzerindeki sorumluluk daha çok artmaktadır. Artık dünyaya tek bir pencereden değil, meselelere birçok açıdan hakim, bilgili bir genç nesil yetiştirmek ve devamını sağlamak bizlerin üzerine vazifedir. Türk şair Necip Fazıl'ın dediği gibi, kim var diye seslenince sağına ve soluna bakmadan fert fert ben varım cevabını veren bir gençlik lazımdır. Bu ağır ve büyük yükün altında olmakla sizler Allah'ın, siz insanlar için çıkarılmış en hayırlı ümmetsiniz. İyiliği emreder, kötülükten sakındırır ve Allah'a inanırsınız övgüsüne mazhar oluyorsunuz. Bu noktada Müslüman gençlere büyük bir örnek teşkil eden abime ve kıymetli başka, başkanına böylesine güzel bir organizasyonla ev sahibi yapmalarından ötürü şükranlarımı sunuyorum. Tırimi Kasi. Ayrıca 12. Uluslararası Gençlik Buluşması'nın gerçekleşmesinde emeği geçen Sayın Enver İbrahim'e, Vadah Teşkilatı'na, Ahmet Azlam'a, Türk İşbirliği ve Koordinasyon Ajansı Başkanlığı TİKA'ya, kıymetli kardeşim Şerif Sarıkaya'ya ve programda emeği geçen bütün herkese şahsım ve kurum adına teşekkür ediyorum. Sizlere Türkiye Cumhuriyeti Cumhurbaşkanı Recep Tayyip Erdoğan ve Baş sözcüsü İbrahim Kalın'ın selamlarını iletiyor ve konuşmamı Muhammed Suresi'nin 7. ayetiyle bitiriyorum. Ya eyyuhellezine amenu in tansurullahe yansurkum ve yusebbit aktamekum. Ey iman edenler, eğer siz Allah'ın dinine yardım ederseniz Allah da size yardım eder ve ayaklarınızı sabit tutar. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. Selamu Aleyküm ve Rahmetullahi ve Barakatuh. Yang berhormat Datuk Seri Anwar Ibrahim, the convener of World Muslim Democrat, Mr. Ali Kut, Secretary General, Union of NGOs of the Islamic World, UNIO, Mr. Fatih Kosar, President of Young Union, of Young Union of NGOs of the Islamic World Yang berhormat Tuan Amiruddin bin Sha'ari Permanent Chairman of Youth Sport Cultural and Entrepreneurial Development Datuk Dr. Sidik Padil President of Wadah Pencerdasan Umat Mr. Fahmi Samsudin The Director of the 12th International Youth Gathering Hadirin hadirat yang saya hormati lagi saya kasihi Ladies and gentlemen, first I would like to call upon the members to the of the floor Re remembrance of MH370 as Muslim let us share our thoughts and prayers for all the victims of MH370 with the recitation of Al Fatiha الحمد لله رب العالمين 
our utmost gratitude is extended to the Almighty upon His blessings to enable the re realization of this meaningful event. We express salawat as a sign of respect by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the vicegrants whose prophethood was for no other except as a rahmatan lil alamin. This international conference is a sign of solidarity of the younger generation of Muslims who support the concept of Islam rahmatan lil alamin. It should be understood that Muslims cherish and express compassion, love, grace and peace of mankind. Any element of extremism should be rejected not only by Muslims but by all mankind. Extremism is a threat to humanity because it threatens the global socio-political stability. Rahmatan lil alamin is a key toward peace and prosperity. It allows us to end the war and lead our civilization towards benefiting humanity. For this reason, this conference ought to be able to lay the foundation for our young brothers and sisters to establish Islamic values as the core for future global security and prosperity. We hope that in the near future, the near future Islamophobia would be a thing in the past. Islamophobia designates the irrational fear of Islam that drives people to make blanket judgments accusing all Muslims of harboring the same murderous fantasies that Muslim extremists express and act upon. The terrifying assassination of the Japanese hostage, the attack of Charlie Hebdo, and hostage of tragedy in Sydney, shadowing the phenomenal rise of ISIS, heightens the global Islamophobia, which possess a great challenge for this conference. This conference provides the avenue of ideas and thoughts for a young generation of Muslim leaders. This young generation should be able to map out Rahmatan lil alamin through the best and ideal approach. We are pleased that the conference features prominent Muslim intelligentsia who shall assist to establish holistic roadmaps for the future of Islam. In elaborating the concept of jihad, the deliberation shall be led by eminent Islamic thinker, Brother Professor Dr. Tariq Ramadan, who will present the Quranic concept of jihad. Knowledge is the essential element toward actualization of Rahmatan lil Alamin. Dr. Said Hairuddin Al Junin, a rising young Muslim intellectual of our time, shall present his view artfully entitled Can Muslim Think? Rahmatan lil Alamin is a spur for Islam or reform. It drives the roadmap for the betterment of humanity. Islamic Renaissance in the 21st century meets a reality by Fulbright scholar Dr. Zulkifli Hassan shall critically enlighten us on the resurgence and renewal of Islam in the modern world today. Rahmatan lil alamin is an amanah, a trust held by all Muslims. We need ideas and action to fulfill the mission and vision of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Quran said, A'uz billahi minash shaitan rajim Inna fi haza labalagun likawmin abidin Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin Verily in this Quran is a message for people who would truly worship Allah and we send not you but a mercy for all worlds Surah Al-Anbiya 
verse 106 to 107. On behalf of the conference, I want to express our sincere appreciation for Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, who has acknowledged as a pioneer and an icon of Islamic revivalism and a champion for social justice in Malaysia and globally. It is interesting to note that the groundbreaking changes in the Muslim socio-politic scenario than we were sparked by the young Muslim generation. Hadirin hadirat yang saya hormati lagi saya kasihi, saya ingin menyampaikan kekhawatiran kami semua. Ya, mudah-mudahan ini bukanlah program yang terakhir Datuk Seri bersama dengan kita. Ya, mudah-mudahan dapat terus bersama memanfaatkan perjuangan dan aspirasi beliau insya Allah sampai bila-bila. Hadirin hadirat yang saya hormati, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank those who have contributed morally, materially, financially, and even spiritually through du'as and prayers toward the success of this conference. And we also wish to express our utmost gratitude to the Selangor State Government for its strong support for this event. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Dato Seri Üstaz Enver İbrahim Kıymetli Genel Sekreter Yardımcım Ahmet Azam Abdurrahman Çok değerli parlamenter arkadaşlar Saygıdeğer misafirler ve sevgili gençler hepinizi saygı ve muhabbetle selamlıyor toplantımızın ve 12. gençlik buluşmasının hayırlara vesile olmasını Cenab-ı Hak'tan niyaz ediyorum Malezya'nın güzel insanlarına güzel kardeşlerime bizleri bu sıcak atmosferde misafir ettikleri için şükranlarımı arz ediyorum Özellikle Selangor eyaletinin temsilcilerine asleten teşekkür ediyorum. Terima kasih. Değerli kardeşlerim, 10 sene önce İstanbul'da başlattığımız birlik yürüyüşümüz elhamdülillah emin adımlarla devam ediyor. İslam Dünyası Sivil Toplum Kuruluşları Birliği, UNIV, her sahada, her ölçekte birlik idealiyle 1 Mayıs 2005'te kuruldu. Bugün 53 ülkeden 226 üyesiyle İslam dünyasının vicdanını terennüm eden devasa bir birlik haline geldi. Açılışını yaptığımız ve 12.sini düzenlediğimiz gençlik buluşmamıza şimdiye kadar binin üzerinde genç kardeşimiz katıldı. Bu buluşmalar sayesinde Gençlerimiz birbirleriyle tanıştılar. Gelecek için ortak çalışmalar yaptılar. İDSB bu tanışmaları ve buluşmaları sadece gençler için değil, her seviyede, her meslek grubuyla ve her statüde gerçekleştiriyor elhamdülillah. İslam dünyasının ihtiyacı budur. Bizler İDSB mensupları ve gönülleri olarak bu uğurda gayret sarf ediyoruz. Bugün burada İslam dünyasının birçok köşesinden gelerek genç İDSB'nin mutat olarak tertip ettiği 12. Uluslararası Gençlik Buluşması'nda İslam dünyasının farklı merkezlerinden gelen ve İslam birliğini temsil eden kıymetli konuşmacı kardeşlerimizin İslam ve gençlik noktasında sunacakları değerli tebliğleri dinleyeceğiz. Peygamber Efendimiz Aleyhisselatü Vesselam İnna Allaha vitrun yuhibbul vitra buyurdular. Allah birdir, biri sever. Bizler tevhid dininin birlik esası üzerine kurulu vahdet dininin mensupları olarak kalu belada beraber idik. Bugün burada da elhamdülillah hep beraberiz. Vahidi ehad olan Rabbimizden niyaz ediyoruz ki 
İnşallah ebedül abad memleketlerinde ala sururi mütekabilin karşılıklı cennet iskemlelerinde de bizleri birbirimizden ayırmasın. Allah bizleri Hz. Adem ile Havva validemizden bir ana babadan yarattı. Sonra bizleri birbirimizle tanışıp kaynaşalım diye kabile kabile kıldı. Bizleri farklı farklı yarattı. Farklı yerlerde, farklı dillerde, farklı renklerde, farklı zamanlarda yarattı ama kitabımızı bir kıldı, peygamberimizi bir kıldı, kıblemizi bir kıldı, bizi birbirimize kardeş kıldı. İnsan nisyana müpteladır, çabuk unutur. Bir olan Rabbimiz unutmayalım, aldanmayalım diye bizlere kitabında innemel müminune ihvetün bütün müminler Müslümanlar kardeştir dedi bizim kardeş olduğumuza ilahi vurgu yaptı. Allah bizlere alemlere rahmet rahmeten lil alemin olan sevgili Habibini gönderdi. Bizleri o kutlu peygambere ümmet eyledi. O ahir zaman peygamberleri bizler hiç peygamberi bizim için en tüm ümmetün vahide sizler tek bir millet tek bir ümmetsiniz dedi. Kitasatu ümme. We are one nation ya. Onun asabı o güneşin etrafında bir yıldız gibi oldular. Tek vücut oldular. Allah onların arasındaki birlik ve beraberlikten razı oldu. Tüm insanlık alemine model olmuş o mübarek insanları kitabında överek onlar kardeşlik hukukunda öyle bir noktada idiler ki kendileri muhtaç olduğu halde kardeşlerinin nefsini kendi nefislerine tercih ederlerdi buyurdu. Onlar bir vücudun azaları gibiydiler. Biri rahatsız olduğunda diğerlerinde uykusuzluk ve ateş basardı. İçlerinden birine yapılan haksızlığı kendilerine yapılmış sayarlardı. Onlar bir binanın omuz omuza birbirine kuvvet veren taşları gibiydiler. İttihad-ı İslam'ı, İslam birliğini önce onlar bize ders verdi. Allah için hicret ettiler, muhacir oldular. Allah için hicret eden kardeşlerine kucak açtılar, ensar oldular. Bizlere üsvetün hasene, güzel bir örnek ve numune oldular. Cenab-ı Hak bu istikamette hepimize Ali İmran suresinde şöyle buyurdu. Ve atasimu bihablillahi cemi'an ve la teferraku. Hep birlikte Allah'ın ipine sımsıkı sarılın, sakın parçalanmayın. Ve zkuru nimet Allahi aleyküm. Allah'ın sizin üstünüze olan nimetlerini bir düşünün. İz küntüm adaen feellefe beyne kulubikum fe asbahtum bi nimetihi ihvana. Hani sizler birbirinize düşmanlar idiniz de o kalplerinizi birleştirmişti. İşte onun bu nimeti sayesinde kardeşler olmuştunuz. Ve küntüm ala şefa hufratim minen nari fe enkadekum minha. كَذَٰلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللّٰهُ لَكُمْ آيَادِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ Yine siz bir ateş çukurunun etrafında idiniz de o sizi oradan kurtarmıştı. İşte Allah size ayetlerini böyle apaçık bildiriyor ki doğru yola felaha eresiniz. Cenab-ı Hak o kutlu asırdan sonra bu ümmet-i merhume doğru yoldan ayrılmasın, ateş çukurlarına düşmesin diye Onlara her asırda imamlar, müştehitler gönderdi. İmam-ı Gazali'ler, Abdülkadir-i Geylani'ler, Mevlana'lar, Şah-ı Nakşibendi'ler, İmam-ı Rabbani'ler ve emsali, emsalsiz kahramanlar hep Allah'ın ayetlerini bizlere apaçık bildiren birer delil oldular. Terti bir mahlukatta tesadüf yoktur. O imamların hiçbiri Bulundukları asırda tesadüfen dünyaya gelmediler. Bu asırda da Üstad Bediüzzaman Hazretleri gibi nice alimler bu hizmet ekseninde hep Allah'ın dinine hizmet ettiler. 
Hazreti Ömer Efendimiz'den rivayet edildiği üzere sevgili peygamberimiz bir hadis-i şeriflerinde bu birlik ve beraberlik noktasında bizlere şöyle buyurdular. Allah'ın kulları arasında öyle bir topluluk vardır ki onlar ne peygamberdirler ne de şehittirler. Ama kıyamet gününde Allah katındaki makamlarının yüceliği sebebiyle peygamberler de şehitler de onlara gıpta ederler. Orada bulunanlar sordular. Ey Allah'ın Resulü onlar kimdir? Bize haber ver. Efendimiz şöyle cevap buyurdular. Onlar aralarında ne bir kan bağı ne de bağış, birbirine bağışladıkları bir mal olmadığı halde Allah'ın ruhu Kur'an adına birbirlerini sevenlerdir. Allah'a yemin ederim ki onların yüzleri mutlaka nurdur. Onlar bir nur üzeredirler. Herkes korkarken onlar korkmazlar. İnsanlar üzülürken onlar üzülmezler. Ve şu ayeti okudu. Ela imme evliyallahi la havfun aleyhim ve la hum yahzenun. Allah'ın öyle dostları var ki dikkat edin. Onlar ne üzülürler ne de mahzun olurlar. İşte bu nurlu yolda Allah için kardeşlik mesleğini nazara veren bu asrın imamlarından Bediüzzaman Hazretleri bize şöyle dedi. Bu asırda dehşetli tahrip edici cereyanlara karşı ancak ve ancak hakikati Kur'an'ı etrafında kenetlenmiş İttihad-ı İslam dayanabilir. Dünya İslam Birliği bu karşımızdaki hücumlara karşı bir direnç gösterebilir. Ve beşeri türlü densizlik, dinsizlik tehlikelerinden kurtarmaya vesile olacak İslam topraklarını yabancıların istilasından ve İslam milletini anarşilikten kurtaracak yalnız İttihad-ı İslam'dır, Dünya İslam Birliği'dir. Esasen küreye arz satında teşkilatlanmış ve mensup olmakla iftihar ettiğimiz ve kuruluşunu eles bezmine dayandırdığımız bir cemiyete benzetilen İslam Birliği'ni Üstad bizlere şöyle tasvir ediyordu. Tarif ettiğim ve dahil olduğum İttihad-ı Muhammedi Aleyhisselatü Vesselam'ın tarifi şudur ki, bu birlik doğudan batıya, Kuala Lumpur'dan, Jakarta'dan, ta Burkina Faso'ya, güneyden kuzeye, Cape Town'dan, Hartum'dan, ta Kırım'a, ta Astana'ya kadar uzanan ve birbirine nurani bir silsileyle bağlanmış muazzam bir dairedir. Dahil olanlar bu zamanda bir buçuk milyar, milyardan ziyade Müslüman kardeşlerimizdir. Bu iddiadın, bu birliğin, bu cemiyetin birleştiği nokta ve birbiriyle irtibat ciheti tevhid-i ilahidir. Allah'ın birliğidir. Üyeleri, kalu beladan beri bu birliğe dahil olan bütün Müslümanlardır. Üye kayıt defterleri levh-i mahfuzdur. Bu birliğin komisyonları ve istişare meclisleri, camilerimiz, mescitlerimiz, medreseler ve zikirhanelerdir. Merkezi Alemeyn-i Şerifeyn'dir, Mekke ve Medine'dir. Bu cemiyetin reisi rahmeten lil alemin olan Aleyhisselatü Vesselam Efendimiz'dir. Faaliyet sahası ise herkes başta kendi nefsiyle mücahede etmek. Yani ahlak-ı Ahmediye aleyhissalatü vesselam ile ahlaklanmak ve sünnet-i nebeviyyeyi ihya etmek. Esas tutmak ve başkalara da muhabbet ve nasihat etmektir. Ed-dinin nasiha. Bu birliğin tüzüğü sünnet-i nebeviye, anayasası ise şeriatın emir ve yasaklarından ibaret olan Kur'an-ı Kerim'dir. Ve kılıcı da keskin gibi, keskin kılıç gibi delillerdir. Zira medenilere galebe çalmak ikna iledir. Zorlama ile değildir. Bu cemiyetin hedef ve maksadı ise ilahi kelimetullah'tır. Allah'ın kelamını yüceltmektir. Elhamdülillah o güzel günlerin yakın olduğunu görüyoruz. Ve Cenab-ı Hak'tan miyaz ediyoruz ki ayak seslerini işittiğimiz İttihad-ı İslam'ı bize en yakın zamanda ihsan buyursun. 
ve bu birliği bize pahalıya satmasın. İslam dünyasının başındaki idarecilerin başlarına akıl, kalplerine iman versin. Tevhid dininin mensuplarının arasını Cenab-ı Hak tevhid etsin. Bizlere iddialı İslam'ın yollarını kolaylaştırsın. Tüm İslam insanlık alemine bir kez daha asr-ı saadetin mutluluğunu ve kardeşliğini yaşamayı ve yaşatmayı bizlere nasip etsin. Şu ümmeti merhume ve şu beşeriyet o iklime, o sese ne kadar muhtaç. Bu duygu ve düşüncelerle hepinizi tekrar selamlıyor. Emeği geçen arkadaşlarımıza bir kez daha teşekkür ediyor. Tekrar hoş geldiniz diyorum. Ehlen ve sehlen. Selamet datank. Welcome. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullah ve berekatü. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatü. Very good morning. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Alhamdulillah, lazi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa din il haqq li yuzhirahu ala din kulli wa kafa billahi shahida wa usallik wa usallimu ala rasulih il karim wa ala ashabi ajma'in wa man tabi'ahum bi ahsanin ila yumin din Excellency State Ministers from Selangor, Penang Sa'ali Kut Secretary General of the Union NGOs of Islamic World Abim President Amidi and leaders Sheikh Siddiq Fadil Ahmad Azam of course I uh, recognize the presence of our dear brother Dr. Tariq Ramadan I was joking with him this morning that my wife will not be present for my speech but would insist to be present for his speech uh, Felix Makwa my friend from Paris Excellency, brothers and sisters, including the delegates from the IIIT who are present. Izin ke saya mulakan dengan menyatakan penghargaan dan salam rakan kita, Menteri Besar, Saudara Azmin Ali, yang memberikan kerjasama dan sokongan penuh dalam acara ini. Dan mengucapkan sangat tinggi terima kasih kepada Ali Kud dan seluruh um, delegasi di Turki yang memungkinkan perjumpaan ini dengan kerjasama rakan-rakan dalam Abib dan pimpinan serta Kerajaan Negeri Selangor dan uh, saya percaya uh, sudah akan dapat uh, ruang dan kesempatan mendengar juga program-program yang dilaksanakan oleh uh, Kerajaan Negeri khususnya Selangor dalam memberi pengisian tentang apa yang kita bicarakan sepanjang seminar ini uh, Dear friends we gather here today in circumstances of turmoil and political unrest in the Muslim world, as yet unprecedented in modern history. Whether it is the Middle East, Indian subcontinent, Europe, hardly a week goes by without some negative breaking news of innocent people being kidnapped, beheaded, shot, or blown up by perpetrators who are ostensibly Muslims. Not since 9-11 have the repercussions of these vile attacks been so far-reaching and pervasive. When the Twin Towers were attacked in 2001, I wrote an op-ed piece from Time magazine a week later, but being still in prison, Sugambulo, it took another two weeks for me to get it out. I had prefaced it with a Quranic reminder on the basic principle that you cannot be unjust. Quote, Never in Islam's history have the actions of so few of its followers caused the religion and its community of believers to be such an abomination in the eyes of others. Millions of Muslims who fled North America and Europe to escape poverty and persecution at home have become the objects of hatred and are now profiled as potential terrorists. 
the nascent democratic movements in Muslim world will regress for a few decades as ruling autocrats use their participation in the global war against terrorism to terrorize their critics and dissenters. Now is 2015. Far worse and pervasive than what we observed in 2001. Religious groups in the name of jihad are trying to outdo each other in their demonstration of faith. Who can kill more, be more violent, and be as uncompromising as possible? Who are the champions in striking fear among those who do not subscribe to their beliefs? ISIS, of course, is the forefront, issuing ultimatums for ransom to be paid for the release of foreign captives and beheading, carrying out mass summary executions. The Taliban on December 16 last year, struck their yet most cruelest cut in depraved violence by attacking a school in Pakistan and massacring 140 children. Two days before that, Boko Haram insurgents kidnapped 185 women and children in a raid in Nigeria. Where Incidentally, 12 of its 36 states have introduced hudud punishments. The government attacked a village, destroying half of it, shooting down men before herding women and children together. Late October, ISIS militants herded over 600 Shia, Christian, and Yazidi men into the desert and executed them at point blank range. Then, of course, there were the horrific murders that were carried out in the office of Charlie Hebdo in Paris on 7th January, followed by the brutal killing of four Jewish hostages. There was widespread condemnation of Paris killings. Once again, the savage acts of a few in the name of Islam had tainted the rest of the Muslim community. Perpetrators have stabbed Islam in the back. It is indeed the height of audacity for these murderers to say that they are avenging the Prophet and protecting the sanctity of the religion. By what authority do they justify killing people for insulting Islam or the Prophet? Islam has survived for 1,500 years without these self-righteous, self-proclaimed defenders of the faith. It can certainly go on for another 1,000 years and more without them. The Prophet was sent unto mankind as a blessing and guidance, not a preacher of terrorism. And that's the theme of the conference, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا كَإِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ we know that during the early mission, all kinds of insults led by Musaylima were hurled at the Prophet and the companions. The companions urged him to fight back. The Prophet's response, let him be, he's just a liar, ignore him. When the enemy stepped up to ridicule him, the Prophet replied, I have not been sent to lay curse upon men, but to be a blessing to them. When the Prophet went to Ta'if, and you know, episode one after another, showing the compassion, the tolerance, and the commitment for da'wah without hindrance. So, where is the textual authority to establish that Muslims should avenge the Prophet by embarking on a killing spree. The Prophet's heart was always filled with love and compassion for humankind. 
tolerance and understanding. These avengers preach intolerance and animosity. So, our response to these killings in Africa, of Afghanistan, or Syria, by the regime, must also be unequivocal condemnation. It is cold-blooded murder, played and simple. There's nothing to justify or rationalize. It is also not the time for moralizing over United States, French, or European foreign policy. As stated earlier, these acts of barbarism are tragically not new. Would recall the reaction of Muslims to the Danish cartoons earlier. Innocent lives were lost and buildings were set on fire as angry mobs in various parts of the Muslim world went to rampage to demonstrate their anger. Nevertheless, much as we must defend the fundamental liberties, the fact is that there is no such thing as absolute freedom of expression, not even in Europe and certainly not in France. When the comic book of the life of the prophet was first published in France two years ago, I had deplored it as sacrilege against Islam. Indeed, I had called for calm and rationality in response, even as we should denounce the cartoons as vile and contemptible. To my mind, the Danish cartoons, Charlie Abdu, caricatures, and the rest of the tasteless and insensitive publications ridiculing Islam and the Prophet are mere manifestations of Islamophobia in all its very guises. They appear to betray a deep-seated Freudian prejudice or animosity harking back to the Crusades. This is most disappointing considering the strong tradition of scholarship of interest in Islam in Europe that has yielded scholars such as William Moore, Richard Burton, Reynold Nicholson, Max Mueller, Goldziher, Ernest Renan, Louis Mazignon, Henry Perrin, to name but a few. Inspired by Hafiz, Goethe wrote West Eastern Diwan. It symbolizes not a clash, but interaction between the West and the East, between Greek and Persian civilizations, and between Christendom and the Muslim world. Goethe's Diwan in turn inspired other works by European writers. In 1924, Muhammad Iqbal himself was moved to publish payam e mashriq The Message of the East, underscoring the role of religion and spirituality in civilization. Now, as we move into the 21st century, instead of great works of literature celebrating intellectual convivencia, between Muslim world and the West were instead inundated with trashy and worthless writings and cartoons clearly aimed at provoking Muslims and causing unrest. A clear line must be drawn between freedom of expression and hate crimes. While we condemn the Paris killings, we cannot subscribe to the chant, Jashui Charlie because I do not support the portrayal of the image of the prophet, let alone caricaturing him in a way. In any way, I do not support blasphemy against Christians, Jews, or other religions. Neither do we support the freedom to incite hatred against anyone or community or account on account of religion or ethnicity or culture. The publication of Charlie Hebdo Cartoons were highly offensive to many Muslims. The French government did nothing to hold to account people responsible for that act of profanity. Now, in the aftermath of Paris massacre, 
Just a few days later, the magazine republished the offensive cartoons and this was officially sanctioned by the French authorities. The issue here is this. Should there be a freedom to commit blasphemy and incite communal hatred? It is true that crimes such as incitement to racial discrimination or hatred will always be challenged as a violation of the right to freedom of expression. But if someone makes a speech clearly liable to arouse feelings of distrust, rejection, or even hatred towards any particular group, it is incitement to racial hatred. His freedom of expression must then become secondary to the right to dignity and freedom from harassment or vilification on account of ethnic or religious differences. In 2007, the European Union approved legislation that would make denying the Holocaust punishable by jail sentences. It's tend to be corrected, sorry, 2007, right? This was said to be a minimalist compromise because of the need to reconcile the protection of freedom of speech with the protection of their citizens from racism and hate crimes. The EU law, the respected representatives are here, mandates prison terms of as much as three years for intentional conduct that incites violence or hatred against a person's race, color, religion, descent, or national or ethnic origin. The same punishment would apply to those who incite violence by denying grossly or grossly trivializing crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Even before that, Holocaust denial laws were already in place in Germany, France, Austria, Belgium, Switzerland, and several other countries. So, this is a classic example or even establish European democracies watering down the freedom of expression. But no one, at least no Western media, has ever framed this issue as a clash between Judaism and freedom of expression. I remember Roger Garaudi, the French philosopher intellect, controversial made a case against this sort of discriminatory laws. I personally have no problem with that. Holocaust history is something very sensitive to the Jewish community. To deny that indeed is to hurt the feelings of the Jewish community. And also to deny that they were victims of genocide. But of course, those who subscribe to absolute freedom will not agree. We can debate this and there's no need to kill anyone. But the question is, why is it perfectly legitimate to hurt the sensitivities of Muslims by depicting their prophet or caricaturing him? Why the double standards? Remember in France, if France is to remain true to its Yes, we, Charlie, credo, which is the metaphor for absolute freedom of expression, then they should repeal the Holocaust denial law or other related laws. They should stop parading on their moral high horse in the name of absolute freedom of expression. No, I do not subscribe to that. I'm challenging a case so that there is not perceived as discriminatory against any race, religion, or creed. But let us look at the case in Malaysia. You can't, uh, action be taken against anyone for blaspheming Islam or ridiculing Muslims on account of their religion. In fact, now to the extent of even touching a dog is a national issue. They go to the far end. Um, because Islam is a state religion. Fair. But 
Why allow the blasphemy or insult to other religions and faith? This is a gathering of majority, yeah, <laughs> Muslims. There are MPs representing other ethnic and religious communities here. There are Christians and Hindus and Buddhists. I appreciate their coming here. But we must have the courage to tell the authorities here that we must set that model and example. We should protect the sanctity of life and property, respect our religion, Islam and our prophets. And we must also show a case in point that we need to also respect the right of Christians, Buddhists and Hindus in this country of ours. As the, even the great libertarian Hayek said, liberty and responsibility are inseparable. Freedom also implies the freedom to speak the truth and not to, speak, uh, to spread falsehood or corrupt public morals. Now there's also a tendency to pin anti-Semitism in Europe to Islamic militants, as in the case of Paris, in the Paris attack. Immediately, the Israeli and French governments were quick to label them as anti-Semitic attacks. Some perspective is indeed is needed here. We may recall the French government has had a history of anti-Semitism. Uh, I read recently a reference made by Tariq Ramadan on this particular subject. While the mantra is now Jesuit Charlie, at one time, more than a century ago, was the accused. That was the title of an open letter of Emil Zola publishing on the front page of a leading Parisian newspaper. Expressed in a highly emotional language, Emil Zola charged the nation's military top brass with conspiracy and anti-Semitism in dealing with the infamous Dreyfus affair. Instead of bringing the caprice to book, the authorities lost no time in arresting Zola, quite familiar here. Charging him with criminal libel and having him tried as a common criminal. The show trial was so well managed that an angry, bloodthirsty Parisian mob gathered outside the court, courthouse clamoring for Zola's head. Anatole France, another eminent man of letters, came to his defense and valiantly testified to Zola's admirable good faith and absolute integrity. But this was no consequence as Zola was hastily convicted and sentenced to jail. I appreciate you, Amidi's reminder about the 10th of February. But I'll stay and fight inside or outside prison regardless. Zola chose freedom instead and dashed off to England. I chose to remain in Kuala Lumpur. By his reckoning, there was a total failure of justice and it would be foolish for him to submit to an utterly corrupt and unjust system. Today, France has swung to the other end of the pendulum in making itself among the most vocal in condemning anti-Semitism apart from the Holocaust denial law. I have no quarrel with that, Felix, no quarrels. But placing anti-Semitism in juxtaposition with Islam, all Islamist activities perpetuate a false dichotomy. It is misguided as well as misleading and only breeds further Islamophobia. You must engage and embrace the moderates, those presenting the Islamic cause, and not have a blanket us against them, the infamous Bush doctrine of war against terror, and getting everyone involved, except, of course, those who subscribe to their views and their values. 
So should Charlie Hebdo attack lead to a resurgence of the clash of civilization narrative? Now I, I, I would appeal to both Tariq and uh, Felix to also address this issue. Could they understand the European society and the utter exasperation of Muslims, innocent, moderate Muslims, the vast majority in Europe, having to face this reaction, this insane reaction to the brutal murders. And among the majority of Muslims who remain committed to peace, harmony, now have become victims. There has been spike of anti-Islam Monday marches under the Pegida banner. What can we expect from a movement that says patriotic European against the Islamization of the Occident, if not more intense Islamophobia? It's interesting, the name's Pegida. It sounds like Pekasa or something. It is therefore not only wrong but harmful to frame the, char to bl frame the Charlie Hebdo killings as a clash between Islam and the freedom of speech, and has taunting Jesuit Charlie. Such a narrative can only add to Islamophobia. Islam and Muslims are not in this battle. Terrorists and murderers are. And they will continue to kill and maim not just to do battle against freedom of speech, but against generally what the free world, including Muslims, want. There is a relevance for this World Forum for Muslim Democrats. So, while istiqamah is enjoined, extremism is forbidden. Fastaqim kama umirta, wa man taba ma'aka wa la tadgaw. We must remain in the right course and we must not transgress. Transgressing the limits means taking things to the extreme. This is the intellectual jihad which is the universal principle that requires respect for knowledge, freedom of thought, publication, and assembly. You made reference to Abdus' call for Ijtihad, Al-Kawakibi, Rashid Reza, Afghani, Muhammad Ab uh, Iqbal in the reconstruction of religious thought. And I think this is the tradition that we must follow. Whilst mainstream and moderate Muslims may find the idea for uh, laudable extremist group like ISIS and to a lesser extent Qaeda and will certainly resent this change. So the battle is also within the Ummah. The battle for understanding and comprehension of Islam is our battle. And in this gathering of youth, we must refer back to the basic or the fundamental principle in the Quran to call for youth to understand and appreciate, to reassert our faith and moral values. <laughs> Innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim wa zidnahum huda. It's only the basic tale of truth in the Quran on the quality of youth because of their faith, their belief, and their understanding of the society. Their reluctance or disgust against a corrupt order and choose basic principles of justice and faith.
Rabbuna Rabbus Samawati Wal Ar Ini di akhir ayat So we all talk about moderation And in Malaysia of course uh, We have now been promoting uh, This whole principle of global movement for moderates But moderates means justice Moderates means rule of law Moderates means a free media, free expression Moderate means a battle against corruption and facade in the society وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَصَفَى لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَى عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا So that is why the unfortunate cases, polemics here about the issue of the Allah and Bible has diverted the whole attention towards knowledge, understanding and tolerance. And uh, with the presence of our brothers here in Triple IT, I must commend them because the focus on the maqasid, the charia, is quite a major effort. People talk about one aspect of Islamic law, including hudud, without looking at the entire contextual requirement of the higher objectives of the charia about peace and order and justice. So it is this pertinent for us to encourage our youth to be more focused on the need for reform and islah mastata. In Southeast Asia, for example, there's much clamor by certain groups for the imposition of one aspect of the Sharia, including Hudud. Much discourse has been there, although I think our reference to scholars like Sheikh Khardawi or Taha Jabir al Alwani or Wahba Zuhaili, among others, have said and reminded us on the basic principle of fiqh awlawiyat in terms of priorities and understanding of the Sharia. I remember reading the discourse by Sheikh Khardawi, who wrote in present day discourse, which make specific reference to this issue which I will not dwell at this juncture. Now Amatya Sen, one of the recent uh, public intellectual, made this reference. The central issues in a broader understanding of democracy of political participation, dialogue, and public interaction. The failure to allow for government by discussion can be seen, for example, in the deprivation of freedom and an independent press. And this is a major problem, major deficit in the Muslim world, with the exception of Indonesia to an extent, and Turkey. There is a large, this huge problem to be addressed by the Muslim world on the issue of transition towards democracy. Apart, against this backdrop, the World Forum for Muslim Democrats was recently established, whose primary role is to provide a common, common platform for leaders, intellectuals, ulama, professionals in the Muslim world to set a new narrative on freedom, democracy, and justice. There will be a zero tolerance for the propagation of extremism, fanaticism, or the so-called jihadism of the likes of ISIS, al-Shabaab, or Boko Haram. We must make it clear that such actions can never be jihad. This is a corruption of Islam of the most vulgar and savage kind. To my mind, a new approach has to, be to, has to be articulated on jihad. And we look forward to hearing, to hearing Sheikh Taha, Sheikh Tariq Ramadan on this, this most controversial issue, almost the term most abused. Whose true imperative is not to drive wars and conquer new lands, but to set example for inclusive engagement and to drive home the message that differences of views are healthy. The crisis of the Ummah today is not 
one of differences of views but of bigotry and intolerance and thus inability to accept the diverse of a diversity of opinions in a wide spectrum of matters brothers and sisters Islam is a blessing and mercy to the entire universe. This is our theme. This is our conviction. But it's a major challenge because too many Muslims and the vast majority of non-Muslims remain unconvinced. Many Malaysians that I know that engage with us are not convinced. Why? Because they see one of the worst examples of governance, corruption, abuse of power are in the Muslim lands. So we have a major challenge. The youth have to take up this challenge. Justice and moderation should always prevail over injustice and extremism in all its varied guises. The atrocities committed by the extremist groups and terrorists constitute a corruption of Islam and I said, I repeat, the most vulgar and savage, savage kind. Our governments, our authorities lack the commitment, the basic tools, the basic ingredients to build up institutions that promote freedom and justice. So when the little space that we have among youth, we must seize that opportunity and build that strong fundamental to clamor for change. These principles of justice, of Rahmah, will be the bedrock for true democratic governance where transparency and accountability will be virtually written in stone. That, to my mind, is the true meaning of Islam. Rahmatan lil alameen. I take this opportunity again to thank the brothers, particularly in Turkey, the union that has been the forerunner in this work to encourage thinking among youth. Abim, and of course, uh, Selangor State Government for its full support and endorsement for this venture. And pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may we be guided, protected under the continuous trials and tribulations that we have to endure. Dengan lafaz bismillah rahman rahim saya dengan ini mengambil kesempatan bagi pihak kerajaan Negeri Selangor untuk merasmikan Sedangkan antara bangsa Assalamualaikum